Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on understanding the NISO 14971-2012. My name is Afida Diani, and I'm the Business Development Manager at Team in North America, Washington, D.C. As many of you may know already, our organization provides certification and customized training services in the medical sector for markets worldwide, including Europe, Asia, Canada, and Brazil. Before introducing our presenters for today, I would like to go over a couple of things. First, if you have any technical issues, please let us know using your chat box. I will try and solve everything while running the session. Note that today's webinar is pre-recorded, so if you have any colleagues unable to attend or if yourself are not able to stay for the entire time of the webinar, we will provide you with a link to the recorded session as well as the PowerPoint presentation later this afternoon. Finally, we will have a brief Q&A session during the last 10 minutes, so if you want to submit any questions, type them using your console. Because we have an important crowd today, we will go ahead and apologize in advance if we're not able to answer all of them. We will, of course, keep track of all the questions and provide answers to each and every one within the next couple of weeks. If you have specific items you would like to discuss with us after the webinar, you can either email us or give us a call using the address and the telephone number provided at the end of this presentation. So I will now leave our speaker, Ms. Gloria Tosti, to introduce herself and the topic of the day. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Florian Tosset. I'm a lead editor and technical file of design the CSSR here at LNEG Med North America. Following several requests, we decided to dedicate once again a webinar on the latest update of the risk management standard, ENI 14971-2012. It has been two years since the standard has been harmonized, but it still creates confusion in its implementation. The goal today is to talk about the changes specific to the EN version of the standard and to share our experience on this topic. A quick note on the content. This presentation is not meant to provide you with training on risk management, but rather to provide you with a clear overview of the changes and what their implementation means for medical device manufacturers. As a quick reminder, the body of the standard remains the same between ISO 14971-2007 ENI 14971 the previous version of the harmonized standard, and the current ENI 14971 2012. Only the informative forwards, which include annexes D, A, B, and C, at the beginning change to reflect and clarify the standard's relationship to the medical device directive. These changes are mainly a clarification of the relation between the harmonized standard and the directive and they highlight the differences between the two. Keep in mind that the mandatory requirements are the ones of the law, therefore the medical device directive. In opposition to standards which are used as tools to demonstrate compliance to the directive. So now let's get started. The agenda for this webinar is First, we will go quickly through the structure of the standard and highlights of the risk management process. Then, we will go in detail through the informative annex D, which is the major change of this revision. We will be focusing on the annex DA, which is from the Directive 9342 EEC. But similar provisions are described for the Active Implantable Device Directive and for the In Vitro Diagnostic Device Directive. So let's get started with the structure of ENI 14971. If you look at the standard, you'll see that it's broken up into three different parts. The informative annex is D, with annex DA, DB, and DT, and the body of the standard with nine sections, and then another set of informative annexes from A to J. The first set of three informative annexes, so A, B, and C, are specific to the harmonized standard ENI 14971-2012. They establish the relationship between the standard and the three main medical device directives' essential requirements. This is why it's called an harmonized standard. Compliance with the clauses of the standard concerns a presumption of conformity with requirements of a given directive. The annex D explains to which requirements, under which conditions, 
and to what extent presumption of conformity can be claimed. In this particular case, the first table of each annex describes the correspondence between the standard and the directive subject of the annex, so the 93.42 EEC if we take annex DA. This is the case for most of the harmonized standards. However, here there are also items that have been identified where the standard deviates or might be understood as deviating from the essential requirements. These items are the topic of the second part of the webinar. The second part of the standard is the main body. This one hasn't been modified and therefore is identical to the ISO 14971-2007. It includes definitions and describes what a risk management process is, the design steps and the documentation it implies. The last section of the standard, and in number of pages the biggest, is a compilation of informative annexes. It gives the manufacturer guidance on tools to apply, example to help understand and implement the provision of the body of the standard. The difference of status between these annexes is that they are part of the original ISO standard and that notes in the standard refer to them. The one at the beginning are the addition of the harmonized standard. So the next slide here uh, is just to summarize the main point of the risk management standard. First, the risk management is a process with input and output. It will include risk analysis, risk evaluation, risk control, production and post-production information. This is a transversal process that is implemented through the whole life cycle of the device, from design to disposal. The risk management file is a component of the device technical documentation, also called technical file or design dossier. This is a tool to demonstrate the safety of the device and to answer many of the essential requirements, either partially or in full. The risk management file is a combination of the risk management plan, analysis, and report. The standard describes what activities and records are needed for, to be implemented for each one of these items. One important point is that the risk management file is a living document, and it needs to be regularly, be regularly reviewed and updated if needed, using post-market surveillance information. The standard annexes give guidance and tools to help implement the provision of the standard, but it is the manufacturer's choice to use one method or another based on its device and its organization. One last point, but a very important one, is to have a team approach. As risk management is a process implemented through the life cycle of the device, qualified people with different backgrounds will bring different inputs to the process. And this will allow the analysis to be as comprehensive as possible. With those major points in mind, Let's jump into what has changed, the ENI so 4971-2012 informative annexes. We will review each one of the points raised in the informative annex for the Medical Device Directive 9342-EEC. The informative annexes at the beginning of ENI so 4971-2012 established the relationship between the standard and the three main medical device directives, the central requirements. This harmonized standard demonstrates compliance with the clauses of the standard that confers a presumption of conformity with requirements of the given directive. After the last version was published in 2009, some competent authorities commented on how the standard and the directive in some respects, as at different requirements, although the standard did not completely answer the requirements of the directive. As a result, CEN clarified and bridged the gaps between the standard and the directive's requirement. Keep in mind that the regulatory requirements have not changed, because the directives haven't changed. The clarifications highlight the differences between the standard provisions and the directive requirements. We will now review each one of them. The first item including in the informative annexes is a clarification on how to treat negligible risk. 
The Annex D.8.2 of ISO 4971 states that, below a certain level, the residual risk will be regarded as so insignificant that it is comparable with the everyday risk we all experience and tolerate. Such risk can be called negligible. The standard goes on to state that, if a risk is already negligible, there is no need to investigate any risk reduction option. In other words, if the risk is called negligible, there is no need to further consider it. The directive, however, doesn't use qualifiers when it's talking about the risk. Instead, it states simply that the risk must be considered and weighted against the benefits of the device. In this sense, there is a gap between the standard and the regulatory requirements. But regardless of the risk, the manufacturer must comply with the regulation and therefore consider all identified risks that a device may present. This is what the annex is clarifying. In practice, this means that risks that may have been previously considered negligible per the provision in place need to be considered in the risk management file. The gap between the implementation of the two revisions of the harmonized standard can be minor if the company's implemented provisions we are also taking into account the directive requirements. The second clarification deals with the manufacturer's discretion in accepting risk. The standard allows the manufacturer to accept a risk at its discretion, meaning the provision in place in its risk management plan, and not to consider it in the overall assessment of the device risk benefit ratio. This could lead to the manufacturer accepting a risk before applying a reduction factor to it. However, the directive requires that all risks have to be reduced as far as possible and that all risks combined, regardless of any acceptability assessment, need to be balanced against the benefit of the device. This means that no acceptability decision can be taken before one or several reduction measures have been taken. In practice, this means that if you have a risk level acceptance criteria that stated, below this level, risk is considered negligible and therefore acceptable. No addition reduction action is needed. This doesn't comply with the directive requirement. A combination of the two first clarifications leads to the conclusion that the acceptability of any risk must be taken after reduction factors have been considered. The next clarification is with regard to which degree the risk should be reduced. Both documents use different terminology. As low as reasonably practic practicable for the standard, as far as possible for the directive. This may be one of the most discussed topics of this modification. The ALAP approach is outlined in Annex D.8 of the standard, which includes the concept of technical and economic practicability. While technical practicability is the ability to reduce risk regardless of cost, economical, economic practicability, according to the standard, is the ability to reduce the risk without making the medical device an unsound economic proposition. However, the essential requirement of the directive states to reduce risk as far as possible, which doesn't leave room for economic consideration. The device's risk should simply be reduced as low as they are technically able to be reduced. In this sense, the directives don't take into account economic practicability with respect to managing the device's risk in order to put the emphasis on the public health. Medical device manufacturers shouldn't base their risk management on how much it costs, but rather how safe a device they could create. Continuing to the next item, we are now considering the concept of risk-benefit ratio. Here again, the directive includes more requirements than the standard. The standard requires the manufacturer to weight the risk against the benefits in the case where overall residual risk in, is not judged acceptable. However, the directive requires an overall risk-benefit analysis to take place in any case 
and in addition, undesirable side effects must constitute an acceptable risk when weighted against the performance intended. As a result, risk-benefit analysis should be performed for the individual and the overall risk in all cases. In practice, this means that if you previously were only considering the standard, you were implementing few risk-benefit analyses mainly when one or the overall risk overall residual risk was not deemed acceptable. And now you have to consider doing one for each residual risk and for the overall risk. We will now talk about risk control options. Both the standard and the directives are calling for them. The standard lists three risk control options. First, the inherent safety by design, then protective measures in the medical device itself or in the manufacturing process, and then the information for safety. And it obliges the manufacturer to use one or more of them in the priority order they are listed. But it leaves the application to the discretion of the manufacturer. The directive gives similar instructions with a little bit more precision. Eliminating or reducing risk as far as possible through inherently safe design and construction, taking adequate protection measures where appropriate, including alarms if necessary, in relation to risk that cannot be eliminated, and informing users of the residual risk due to any shortcomings of the protection measures adopted. However, the directive doesn't give a, sh a choice. It requires to take into account the state of the art and to select the most appropriate solutions by applying cumulatively the risk control options. This next point is the continuation of the previous one, adding information related to the first risk control option, inherent safety by design. Here, the directive gives a little bit more precision regarding this mode of risk control. The standards only talk about using inherent safety by design as first risk control step, where the directive requires to eliminate or reduce risk as far as possible inherently safe design and construction. Manufacturers should reduce the risk to a minimum implementing safe design and construction before moving to the next step of control. The last point of clarification is related to user information and residual risk. As seen a couple of slides before, the standard includes the information provided to users that details the safety and risk of the device as a risk control option. In other words, the standard uses this information for safety as a way to control the risk of the device to the user. The directive, on the other end, doesn't use the information provided to users as a way to reduce the risk of the device. Instead, the information is simply a way to inform users of the residual risk. In this sense, manufacturers shouldn't attribute any risk reduction to the information to users for safety. For example, writing in an IQ or user manual that there may be a risk of allergy of, or irritation doesn't reduce or eliminate the risk itself. This should be done using another method, such as choosing the material. But gives, it gives the end user information about the residual risk. So we now have gone through the clarification points that are outlined in the new informative annexes to ENI 1491-2012. And to conclude this session, we would like to do a short conclusion with a brief reminder. First, the requirements of the medical device directives prevail on the ones of the harmonized standards. Conforming to harmonized standards give presumption of conformity to the essential requirements of the directives. However, if there is a gap between the standards and the regulation, the regulation should be followed. And then, the device risk management file should be regularly updated using post-market surveillance data, 
but also considering, it should also consider the evolution of the state of the art, such as updating standards and regulation, which is what happened with the change in this standard. And that just about wraps up our webinar on the modification of the harmonized standard ENI 14971 2012. Thank you so much for staying tuned, and I hope that you have found the, the webinar informational. As Brian mentioned, this is the end of our webinar session. So now feel free to just uh, write down all the questions that you have using the chat box. We will list anyway all the questions you ask through the entire webinar, so we will consolidate them and send out the answers in the next couple of weeks. Like I said, if you can't wait, basically, and if you have a very urgent items you want to share with us, you can just give us a call or send us an email using the email address gmail.ma at lne-gmail.com. Again, thanks again for listening, and I hope you had a great day.